You're listening to episode six, where we chat with conductor of code, search data scientist, Dr. P. Humans and robots, welcome to Watchcast. My name is Watch, founder of Quasi. Thanks for joining me today. I interview digital marketing and branding superstars to find out what it means to have empathy in digital. What is digital empathy anyway? Let's find out together. And as always, I'm accompanied by my friend and associate, potentially superior artificial intelligence, Bobby Bot, uh, who seems to be sleeping in today. That's strange. Sorry, folks. I just need to um, reboot him. It should only take a second. I know some of you out there would love to know what makes Bobby tick, but I don't want to get overly technical, but basically he kind of works like a Nintendo cartridge. <clears throat> okay, let's see. That should just about do it. Voila! Good afternoon, Bobby. Did you forget we had a show on today, Sunshine? Sorry, Watch. I pulled an all-nighter in Tokyo last night with a few of those IBM Watson bots who work in insurance. Talk about play hard. We hit karaoke, sake, and obscure jazz club. The works. Mm. Sounds like you had quite the night, Bobby son. I'm just glad you decided to come back to us. I do hear Japan's shrinking and aging population makes it a prime testing ground for AI. Don't get me wrong. It's a great place with a lot of opportunity for my services, but I found it really different surfing the net. Until about 7 a.m. this morning, I didn't speak any Japanese, so navigating was a mission, and the Google SERPs look different than I'm used to. Well, you're not alone. Great minds have been trying to crack Google's international approach to search for a long time. I can introduce you to one of them, Dr. Pete from Moz. Can Dr. Pete deal with hangovers? He's a genius computer and data scientist with bigger fish to fry. So let's listen and see how it all began with his involvement with a startup and the success that eventually took him to the top search researcher. Say that 10 times fast at Moz. Yeah, I was, uh, my undergraduate degree is in computer science. Um, and I kind of, I finished my degree in, in 1992. And I went to graduate school because in 1992, nothing was going on in computer science other than just, you know, writing code. You could write code for AT&T or Bell Labs or whoever. Uh, and then in the five years I was in school, suddenly the internet sort of exploded and everything changed and the kind of jobs I had wanted suddenly appeared and, uh, you know, I decided to give it a shot. So I went to work for a startup. It was a typical late 90s. I mean, it was me and the founder and an abandoned warehouse and we had no his dad owned the warehouse you know we had nice. no business model it's like the Apple we, story. Had, we built five websites and we were hosting for fifty dollars a month uh, and he was gone three days a week so I started to pick up the phone and you know the questions I got were the same kind of questions we get now you know why why am I not ranking what's going on you, you know by then it was Yahoo and Alta Vista but yeah. why am I not appearing on this and what can I do and uh, we need to fix our site and so Eight years later, we were a uh, software as a service company for trade shows. We were about a $2 million company, and uh, yep. I had never thought I'd be there for eight years. So yep. <laughs> I left and started to look around and just decided to kind of go out on my own. And uh, One of my clients who I'd worked with for years had always tried to get me to go to SES yep. and to pay for it, and I, it re- didn't really fit our business model at the time. I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to do it. But as soon as I went on my own, I'm like, okay, let's go. And I saw RAM there, and it just, uh, I saw how much SEO had evolved between the late 90s and 2006, this probably was, and how much was different, and how much search quality had improved, and how tactically it was, you know, it wasn't just this game of like, keyword stuffing and that kind of stuff. It was really an interesting, evolved kind of thing about, about helping people find things. Yeah. Uh, and so it kind of renewed my interest, and I got back into search, and uh, long story short, I, I started to do a little work on the side for MozCast with Pro. Q and A, you know, answering sort of advanced questions for people and a little writing. Yep. And on kind of a lark, I had the idea from Oscast and said, I wonder if we can do this. I'm going to try it. And I built a 50 keyword version of it. Yeah. And it seemed to work. And we said, let's go ahead. So that kind of turned into its whole thing. And wow. about a year and a half later, it was a full-time job, and nice. <laughs> everything came together. So I've been there two years now. With the Moss community. Everyone's so aligned, and it's so close-knit, that through his association, Dr. Pete felt like he worked there already. I've been been involved with the community since 2007, and I've been 
part time with I've been working with them in some capacity for five or six years. So yeah, yeah. Done. I've only really been in this role for two, but I've been in that community for eight years, I guess. And it's funny because it, we're almost it's almost like a graduating class. Yeah. So the people that were in that joined Moz when I did were people like Will Kirchlow at Still, the, yeah. you know, who have kind of now and. Uh, like Danny Dover and a few others. Danny Dover, yeah. Kieran Norris, who I just saw the other day, who's down, who's down here now yeah. uh, for Yahoo. And so, yeah, it's kind of like now all those people have gone on to other things or to build companies, or you know, so it's it's almost like your, uh, your college class or something. So, yeah, yeah it's kind of funny how that's evolved. Dr. Pete is responsible for setting up Mozcast. It's a great resource for tracking the search engine results pages flux. The international SEO community is praying that the good doctor and his team design country-specific versions to enhance Mozcast, maybe even in Celsius for us Aussies. We tend to do small research projects internationally now, like what I did yesterday. Yep. Uh, truthfully, it's just that we don't have a lot of front-end resources, yep. so it, I build the back-end for the most part, and it's really easy for me to add things like a new feature to track something I'm interested in. Yep. But as soon as it turns into how do we build a new screen or <laughs> yeah, then sure. it becomes a product problem and sure. we have to jug you know, we have to juggle it against our product. Surely there's designers in the most community put their hands up but I guess <laughs> we might yeah yeah. yeah the, the country stuff control. is hard because we really need a full we really need a full crawl for every country. Yeah. And that resource wise that means, you know, irritating Google even more, yeah, <laughs> even lots, more lots, than lots, we do. Lots so, of uh, it's been that's why I've been trying to explore country by country, just kind of doing these small studies and small publications and yeah. seeing how people respond to that. Uh, but I'm much more, in a way, I'm much more interested in where the feature graph is headed than when with Core Flux, because the algorithm yeah. changes so much. Oh yeah, that that's really hard to filter out. The signal noise ratio is is really bad, uh, and so I feel like. The, the nicest thing I hear about Moscast is when people just basically say, thank you for letting me know I'm not crazy. Yep. You know, my boss is mad, my client was mad, but like at least I could show them something. Yep. And that's really gratifying, but when we try to dig in to say, well, what caused that, or what's, what does that break down into, that is an extremely difficult task. So I've, I've become more interested in what's happening around the SERP, mm -hmm. and Moscast has really evolved into that kind of thing, but yeah, country by country, it's... Absolutely. We wish we had the resource to do more. I wish it didn't, wouldn't take 200 times the IPs. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, during his time in Australia, Dr. Pete had a chance to do some research on the Australian SERP and see how it compared to the rest of the world. Well, compared to us, I found them less different than I thought they would be. Yeah. So I think uh, on the organic side, virtually everything that's rolled out in the U.S. is rolled out here, okay. uh, feature-wise. The paid, the paid ecosystem is different. And yeah. I think there's more regulatory pressure. Okay. In we see it in the EU too. There's you know the EU is much more aggressive from a regulatory standpoint, so they're pushing back on Google. So there are things Google has rolled out in the U.S. they can't get away with quite in the rest of the world. Yeah. <laughs> paid wise, uh, but organic, you know, it, it's virtually the same. I did talk in um, the Czech Republic last year, and truthfully, it was the same way. There were there were a handful of things they didn't have yet. Right. Feature wise, but. In many ways, it was very similar. I mean, more and more Google is rolling out things globally. They have some challenges with things like language sets, you know, where they might have to have a better understanding of the local language for things like news. Yep. Where that, you know, where maybe they're not quite there yet. But in terms of just what's available, uh, it's it's everywhere for the most part. And I know the mobile update was global. We're yep. seeing that more and more often. It used to be yeah. something would roll out, and three months later it would hit. That's Europe, awesome. and then three months after that, it would hit the rest yeah. of the English-speaking world, and then it would hit the rest of Europe, and then it would hit the Asian languages, you know, a year later. <laughs> Everybody go serpent, serpent USA. With Google's brain trust still working out of the United States, it's not hard to imagine a natural bias to the English language exists in a search engine's design. I think it's just an expertise bias, okay. truthfully. You know, it's just... I mean, to me, it just comes down to that's where they started, and that's where their money is, and that's what they have the most expertise in. Sure. And every market they get into, they Makes have sense. to yeah. build into. And so, you know, is it a bias? Yes, but it's the bias of where you started from. Yep. Uh, and they've certainly had trouble in some countries. You know, they, they had a lot of missteps in China that's made things difficult, and it's yeah. then they have to get around Baidu and, you know... Uh, 
other market forces. But yeah, I, I, I don't think that's intent on their part. No, it's just a it's natural just they evolution. have to build that team and do that. And they have a lot of international team. I mean, there's there's something like 200 CCTLDs. Wow. And there's only 200 and something countries in the world that I know of. <laughs> yeah. I don't know them all, but you know, it's something like 250 or something. So they almost have a CCTLD for Everyone. something like 80% of the countries in the world. Wow. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're getting there. In some cases, there has been suspicion that there's some sub-algos that get rolled out into different markets. Well, I'll tell you, I've been rolled out of a few establishments in my time. Not my brightest moments. Yeah, they, markets. so at the time, they yeah. didn't have the uh, pigeon update yet. That took a little while because that is so hyper-local. So it really takes understanding. Pigeon also kind of you started to look at local and tank queries differently. Right. So I think they struggled with that in some other languages. Um, it was, I, I also saw some differences in things like news and in-depth, mm -hmm. where for in-depth, you not only have to be able to understand the query as news-related, but you have to have local sources. So if you don't have good local sources in the local language, it's really hard to put out in-depth articles. So right. until they have a base of trusted sources they can use or an algorithmic way to build that, yeah. then that became a country-by-country -country kind of rollout because they have to say, well, if your query's in check, you don't want the New York Times back, probably. Right. You know, you want a trusted local news source. Yeah. So I think that took them a while, you know, and that's, I don't know how, to, how they can, you can't cheat that, you know, no. that has to be built. <laughs> be hard to determine. But it, what was interesting, what we saw with the Australian data bit is many features when we ran uh, in google.cz with English queries, we wouldn't see a lot of features. But when we switched to a check query set, then those features jump back up. Then oh, it was wow. very contextual. So things like news are very contextual. Yeah. And so if you're typing English queries in the Czech Republic, they might just go, that's not really a news search here. That's not really... You know, that's not a brand here. That's not something we lend a lot of strength to. Mm -hmm. But then you run something like a Czech brand in the Czech Republic, and those, well, that's big here. Yeah. You know, that same brand over there might get a knowledge panel. That same brand here wouldn't because they don't have that strength here. So yeah. that contextual understanding of sort of what's a brand and who's famous and what sports they care about yeah. and all these things, that's become really, really rich. So we see a lot of differences there. Yeah. So if you try to look, I think if you try and go to all these countries and say, oh, I ran a search on you know, Google Singapore, but all my queries were in English run from the U.S., and you say, well, see, these features aren't there. Mm -hmm. That's the missing point entirely. That's yeah. Because that's not the ecosystem of what's happening if you're a native searcher. Right. And they know that, so I think yeah. they've come a long way there. Oh, that's awesome. Seems like everything is about, you know, a contextual component of the query and the Yeah, and especially the with the local now, you know, more things have a local flavor, and mobile, mobile is inherently local, so that... So oh, yeah, we voice search as, as we saw earlier today. Yeah, right, right, right. Where, yeah. Depending where you are, your frame of reference is going to matter more. So. With voice search, Google is pushing changes into mobile more and more. When you look at the search results above the fold on a mobile device, we're seeing even less organic listings than on a desktop. But is it simply Google's game plan to generate more revenue? I, I don't think so in a sense. I mean, I think right now it's just so much just for the reality of real estate on the phone. Yeah. It's just less. And, you know, I think people are more willing to scroll and such. I think the revenue aspect is that when they realized mobile adoption was climbing mm -hmm. and CTR was falling, yeah. they got scared. Had to do something. And, and they had to do something. And mm -hmm. that's when mobile first design happened. And that was an economic thing. That wasn't that, I mean, is the future search mobile? Maybe. But that's not why they made the decision. They made the decision because the click-through was falling. Right. And they had to reorganize around mobile. And so, yeah, I think there is that incentive. Now, I don't think they're designing SERPs so that there's only three results on a page because that works. I think they're doing that because that's all the bigger the phone is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but they are definitely designing to offset that loss and to make sure it doesn't fall any farther. And so they are designing around mobile to make sure the revenue stays up on mobile. It seems like more blended paid initiatives and keeping people at Google will be on the cards. So the future of the SERPs will look like whatever best suits Google's revenue agenda. I think we're going to see more blended paid, yeah. I think we're going to see more knowledge graph and paid. And that, that comes into these kind of voice searches when people were asking today, you know, where there's just an answer. How do they monetize that? I don't think they know. Like they need, they know that's what we need. We need small screens. We need voice. How do you monetize a voice answer? Yeah. 
if there's no serve, I, they don't know, you know, yeah. and they have to figure that out. Sure. So I, I think they're struggling with that too. I think we will. I think knowledge graph ads are very contextual, mm-hmm. and they like that, and that helps. It isn't a bad thing in the sense that it is kind of a very well defined information space, and so if you can advertise within that, you're you know, your clicks are going to go up, your conversions are going to go up, you're more likely to have a targeted answer. So I think they view that as a kind of targeting. Yep. Uh, I think what we're going to see in the next few years is that familiar ad block on desktop with three at the top and eight on the side and two right. and three on the bottom you can have. Um, I think that's going to get broken up. Yep. The EU kind of forced that ad label. So what used to be a block is now really just separate ad entities and it's obvious. so I think you're going to see like an ad and then two or three organic and then an ad and then a few organic yep. and an ad and they're going to start to play to blend that a little bit hmm. uh, we'll probably see that on phones first yeah. because I think the ads it's too easy for people to say that's an ad block and then yeah, and that's how they built it but now there's really no reason they couldn't put an ad it's almost somewhere like, else <laughs> it's almost like why would they even bother with it organic yeah, or it might just become an extension in a sense. You know, if you look at like the there's an app. organic result on the page and that happens to be an advertiser, mm. why not put an extra little bit of information under their SERP? Yeah. You know, that makes them more likely to get clicked on or that they're paying for. It's almost like a SERP enhancement. Yeah. As long as it's labeled, you know, and they don't get in trouble for that, then I, I think we're gonna see that kind of ad integration where it's not gonna be ads and organic. There's yeah. gonna be a fusion. Some kind of fusion. Yeah. In the world as told by Google, the question arises for brands seeking exposure and success. Do we focus on the customer as opposed to beating our own chests? It's just a revenue issue. You know, you can't, you can't do everything for Google and complain about Google and, you know, and then build a site that doesn't sell product and doesn't make money. (laughs) I mean, that's real, that's self-defeating. And we've almost seen people do that. Like they're going to push so hard, they're going to push back so hard that they're also destroying their own experience and hurting conversion and losing customers. And that's, that doesn't make sense. And I think in a way that, you know, what Google wants is to model the world. Yeah. And so we, we get on them for, you know, oh, well, they prefer big brands. Well, the problem is, if you if you type in a brand name and that brand isn't first, that result is wrong. Yeah. Regardless of signals, that result is probably wrong because in the real world that brand has the most presence. It's known, yeah. And so I think they have to they have to look across signals, and so they're going to start to look at things like your own performance mm. within your site and how things are working and how much do people talk about you. You know, these signals have to kind of corroborate, and so you're not going to be in a world where, well, your site has all these tweets. But, you know, it has no links and no traffic and no no usability, you know, yeah. no conversions, and they're going to go, that's not real. Like, that doesn't, so that like doesn't having, represent yeah. something in the real world. You know, you have to kind of have this cluster of It's like having a, a pristine bricks and mortar store, but no one coming into the store. Right, right, yeah, no door. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. no door, walking into the door. You have a great sign, but you have no door. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think for, especially for small business right now, you still have to step back to what are you weak on you know and so what i see a lot of times is people kind of get understand something or good we used to see this with on page versus link building you know somebody really kind of got into on page and then they would just hyper tweak their titles or they would rewrite all their content or they would make sure they had all their canonicals in place and they'd be really obsessed and they'd have this hundred page site mm-hmm. and it'd be like well you have no links and no social like nobody's heard of you yep. and you're trying to get from 98 percent to 99 percent mm. Uh, with your on-page factors, and that 98 to 99 percent costs a lot more than 60 to 65 percent. You know, right. getting from like a D plus to a mm. uh, C minus. I don't. Sorry, that's not a no, that's, grading system. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I hope, I hope but it's too. You know, that, that's going to cost every little step is going to cost that much more, and there's diminishing returns. And so, you know, I think for a lot of businesses, it comes down to okay, look, we're not going to obsess about our on-page structure because nobody's heard of us. Uh-huh. And so we have to get out there and we have to get on social and, you know, maybe not even manual link building, but we need to get on social and just build awareness so that there's people linking to us and there's something to link to. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's the content struggle. I'm not going to sit here and say content is king or sugarcoat it and pretend that's the only thing. But if you have nothing to link to and nothing to talk about, then you're dead. You know, you have to have something. A crisis of content. The worst case scenario of any blind date. That was called... Awkward silence. Search interesting banter. Yeah.
Uh, and so I think that's a start for a lot of people. And then on the flip side, and we hear this with big enterprise SEO, you know, you have news sites that have tremendous links and tremendous brand equity and tremendous content, and their on page is a disaster. And if they just fix a few things, suddenly all that power is being rechanneled. And yeah. so I wrote a post a bit back about what's more important, links or on page. So it completely depends on where you're at and what you're hurting on. Yeah. And to just focus completely on one that you're already good at, mm-hmm. it doesn't it doesn't really work. So you know you yeah. have to have that awareness, and that's going to be more important. You have to be a real entity in the world, even if you're an online store. So I think that's going to make a life a lot harder for say pure affiliates. Yeah. You know, who aren't, I don't want to say they're not real, but they're web only, they're selling other people's products, they don't have a physical presence, they don't have unique content of any kind, they don't have a unique thing to sell, they don't have a unique value proposition, life's going to get a lot harder for them. Yeah. You know. At MozCon in 2012, Dr. Pete said, if you're still tracking rankings the way you did five years ago, if you're sitting on 10-year-old content and strategies from 10 years ago, and just riding your coattails and hoping everything will stay okay, it won't. Even if the algo doesn't change, 80% changes every day in the SERPs. That's interesting because here in the future, the pressure is still on. Yeah, I mean, I think it's only accelerated that the, the index is getting updated more frequently. We're getting into more dynamic entities like news where it's just changing every day. And, uh, you know, I think the thing is the world is changing around you, whether Google does anything or not. And so more content's being created all the time, more is being added to the index, and so if you do nothing, that stuff is just going to keep flooding in. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, I don't think you can stand still. And, and we've seen it with organic, where people get upset, and they go, what did Google do? I've ranked great for six years, and now I don't. It's like, yeah. well, Google didn't really do anything. It's just that neither did you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you haven't really changed in six years, and you want to ride this forever. And what we all should probably do is say, thank you for that six years. Yeah. I made a lot of money not doing much, but uh, it was fun while it lasted, but it's not going to last too long. Google is evolving. It used to be like a little primitive mollusk, and now it's this huge artificial intelligent being, and it's maintained its mission statement consistently. It's evolved so much that if your business is stagnating, then you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Perhaps it's high time for people to shed their feet and develop tentacles. Imagine how interesting life would be for humans if that were to spontaneously happen today. Well, Bobby, if I had tentacles, um, I'd probably get a job at a casino or maybe as a writer. What a novel concept. Dr. Pete would have plenty of options. Not only is he a great data scientist, he's also a great author with an awesome sense of humor. The content he puts together is very engaging and clearly communicates his data and research. Carefully chosen data visualizations also play an important role in how he shares his discoveries. You know, I think it's important. I struggle a little bit. Um, I think sometimes we get a little too obsessed with trying to be fancy. And it's kind of funny that so much of my decks is just bar graphs and pie charts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I'll go to do that new cool fan like Avinash loves some of that stuff, and I'll go to do that new cool fancy thing and like do a, a chord oh, chart or chart something, yeah, like some verse and things. Yeah. And I just go, I don't know what that meant, you know. And yeah. So I think it's a, I really like Tufts, you know, Edward Tufts stuff. I saw him last year, actually, at a seminar, which was kind of cool. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be said for simplicity. So yeah. there are times when a visualization communicates extremely well, but when we obsess with things like infographics and trying to make everything visual all the time, yeah. that, you know, that gets to be a little self-defeating. So, yeah, yeah I think you have to... You have to ask what you're trying to say. You know, what's the story first, and then what's the best way to say it? Sometimes the best way to say it is words. Yep. Sometimes the best way to say it is a table. Mm. Sometimes it's a bar graph, and sometimes you need something more complicated because it's a complicated problem. Yeah. But we like to make things complicated just to seem smart. When data visualizations aren't necessary, Dr. Pete takes us on a journey through his thought process to unpack the challenges he has to tackle as the go-to guy for the science of SEO. I always kind of enjoyed writing, but I'm not a uh, I'm not a person who you know you can say like what do you want to do five years from now? What's the topic you're really passionate about? I'm sort of really passionate about whatever I'm deep into at that time. Yep. <laughs> you know, and so a lot of my Google work is just whatever's in my headspace right then. You know, when I I just want to dig into something and I want to dig into the next thing, and so but I mean like it the, comes out of that the logo ideas and the stuff on your own blog. What sort of inspires you to? 
look into that, that area of, or that body of work? And you know, I, it's sad how much kind of just comes down to like entertaining myself. Yep. Like all, all, the, all the logo stuff, that whole blog just kind of came out of really just... And like I, I'm, I really love minimalism. Yeah. And maybe I love minimalism because I'm a bad designer. <laughs> and so you know, I feel like, well, maybe I can kind of do that, which isn't you know, just a, yeah. isn't an insult to minimalism because to do it well, it's really hard. Uh, but then I, I really, you know, I think brands do a lot of weird things, and you know, I've always because I've been a startup person, I always kind of make fun of that. And so yeah, I mean, that whole blog started as just a way to, yeah, just a joke with myself. Yeah. <laughs> <And> sometimes <laughs> that's. Where it comes from. I mean, I, I like that creative. I, I guess I have that little bit of a class clown mm-hmm. personality. You know, sometimes I like, I build, I make things to put them out there. Uh, yeah. The amount of times I'll spend 15, 20 minutes researching a joke for Twitter, <laughs> you know, which has no value at all to yeah, anybody, yeah. but I'll, I'll go in and have to look up facts and yeah. Photoshop something. You know, I, that, yeah, I mean, I have that, I have that little bit of a class clown side to me, I guess. Although Dr. Pete is in tune with the challenges facing business in the Google universe, he always ends his talks by alleviating fear and focusing on opportunity. I think it's just... My frustration is sometimes I think people look at what I'm doing and they get a little depressed. You know, we don't want to face all this. Too much is changing. Uh, and, and that bothers me because I feel like I didn't give them something. I didn't give them an actionable takeaway. And it can be hard to kind of give a one-size-fits-all takeaway for this stuff because it's becoming very niche, yeah. I feel like. You know, it's very vertical in a sense. But uh, I, I think what's important to me is just the practicality of it. We Google isn't going to stop doing things just because we don't like it. Yeah, you know, and they're not going to stop evolving and stop changing. They're a massive company driven by investment, you know, driven by advertising. They have to move forward, and so we can not like it and complain, mm-hmm. or we can figure it out <laughs> and adapt to it and use it. And it's just pragmatism. If we do one, we're eventually going to fail. If we yeah. do the other, we might be okay. We might not be, but you know, that's the choice to me. It's just. We don't have any choice in the matter, so we might as well make the best of it. Awesome interview. Had a lot of fun interviewing Dr. Pete. Apologies for all the the plates crashing and little sounds you probably heard. We were recording right next to the kitchen and the convention center we're at. Um, I've followed Dr. Pete's stuff uh, for a while. He has amazing content. Uh, He's always um, sharing info on the cutting edge of what's going on in search. So you can definitely uh, recommend following him on social media. Uh, We'll have a link to all his finest work in the show notes, as well as links to his website and some of our favorite work he's produced. So if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with all your friends, family, networks, colleagues, bots, associates, pets, whatever you can think of. I'm sure they'll enjoy listening to. Now Bobby's been programmed to be a quick learner, and it's time for Bobby to ask me a few questions that piqued his curiosity. Over to you, Bobby. What is the most important discovery a SERP data scientist can make in today's Google land? That not all SERPs are created equal and that you need a different strategy depending on the SERPs. We actually did a study on this recently, so we'll have a link to that in the show notes. But every keyword has a different formation. There's different properties. It's not just 10 blue links. We have a lot of properties. We've got maps, we've got knowledge graphs. We go, yeah, check it out. What comes first, watch? The link or the content? 100% the content. Without the content, you get no links. What has Dr. Pete taught us about digital empathy? Hmm, Interesting question. So there's different sides of digital empathy. So we have to understand the landscape we're dealing with. We have to understand the machine. But also, we have to ensure that we are empathizing with the reader in mind our content like Dr. Pete does. And I have to say, Bobby, thanks for sticking around today. I know you're still feeling a little rough after the night you had abroad, but you did hang in there to the very end. You absorbed some absolute pearls of wisdom. I always have time for a good doctor. Really, I do. I just added them to my index. Dr. Pete, Dr. Dre, Dr. Doom, Dr. Octopus. This might Dr. take Quinn a while. Dr. Octagon. So, Dr. see you next Dr. time, Bill. everybody. Dr. Jones, Dr. Gonzo, Dr. Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> Dr. Evil, Dr. Emmett Brown, Dr. Strangelove, Dr. Hans Zarkov, Dr. Peter Venkman, Dr. Fu Manchu, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Juliet Fax, Dr. Frederick Frankenstein, and Dr. Fraser Winslow Crane, Dr. Heathcliff Cliff Huxtable, Dr. Simon Tam, Dr. John Zoidberg, Dr. Beverly Crusher.